worship you, to praise you, to glorify you, to magnify your name. I submit and commit the ministry of the Word of God into your hands once again. I ask and I pray, Lord, you think through my thoughts, speak through my vocal cords. That you would go forth, let it accomplish that which you sent to accomplish in every one of our lives. And we'll be careful to give you all the glory and the praise. And I thank you that you always confirm your word with signs, wonders, and miracles. Father, I pray as your will is done in heaven, let it be done in our midst once more again. Let a fresh anointing rest upon all of us to hear your word, to receive your word, and truly understand your word, and truly become doers of your word. And I thank you, Lord, what you're doing in our midst. Once again, I pray, Lord, the name of Jesus and the word of God will be lifted up and exalted in our midst, and that thy will be done in our midst, even now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. On Saturday, as you all know, it was the first full day of the of Nisan 1. We are in a biblical month called Nisan. The Bible calls it that. And the Bible refers to it as two names. Abib first, um, before um, Israel, the, the, the Jews went into captivity. Um, it was called Abib, the first month, when they spent 70 years in captivity in Babylon, when they left after the 70 year, years of captivity, when they came back to the land, they called it a Babylonian name called Nisan, right? And it's the first month. So God said in Exodus chapter 12, um, when he was re getting ready to, uh, when he was ready to bring the Jewish people out of captivity, he said in Exodus chapter 12, I'm reading verse 1 and 2, this just remind you, and the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you as the beginning of months. Now on Saturday we took a little time and we talked about the beginning of months. It's, it's, it's a New Year's Day from God's perspective. And we should see it that way too. It's, uh, God, wants, God is always wanting to do new things. And we should allow him to do new things. Now you have to understand that he's telling them that this is the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. So he changed time. Right? At, to, uh, prior to all this, the seventh month used to be the first month. Right? And we know it as today the Jews call it Tishri. But, you know, back in the Hebrew days, it was called month one, month two, and all that kind of stuff. And... So the seventh month got flipped around and it became the first month, all right? And then going forward, the eighth month would have become the second month. The ninth month would have become the third month. All that got changed, right? So and it, where, where did it get changed? Right here, chapter 12, right? When they were still in slavery, when God is ready to bring them out, he's saying there's some changes here. Right? And he says, I want you to make note that this is going to be the beginning of months for you, and it should be the first of the year for you. So this is when you start to count time. Amen? And that's what he was saying. So he, put, he, he, he brought in something new. He changed things around. And um, ever since then, this first month has been special to God. And we should see it that way too. Because we know the story, how God brought the Israelites out of bondage. They were in bondage for over 400 plus years. They were in slavery. As you heard the message on the weekend, with Pastor Fay, they, they, they spent a fair number of time in, in slavery, in bondage. And God is doing something new. They are no longer going to be slaves. God. He's going to set his people free. And he wants Moses to take note, this is the beginning of months, this is going to be the new year for you. And therefore expect new things. Things are going to be different. It's like when we become a born again Christian, the Bible says in the book of Corinthians, he says, behold, old things pass away. Behold, all things, not some, all things become new. All things, from the day you got born again, all things should be progressively becoming new. And old things should be, if they haven't passed away already, should have already passed away, depending on how long you've been saved and how close you are to the Lord. 
But this is what God is all about. He's into new things. Mm -hmm. And he likes to start things new. Amen. He likes to give us a fresh start. And he's given the Israelites, those who've been in captivity for over 400 plus years, a fresh start to taste freedom, to see what it's like to be free, yeah. to worship their God when they, when, when, he, when they want to, without being in bondage, without having to go out and, and, and work for someone else, and all the profits and the benefits goes to someone else, and they don't get any of that. You know, that's, that, that, that's, that's slavery, they're being abused. They were, they were being abused. Yeah. In fact, the Bible says at the beginning of the Exodus, they were so abused, God showed up and he spoke to Moses and said, I, I've heard the cry and the groaning of my people. I've come down to deliver them. And guess what? You're the one I'm going to use. Well, Moses didn't really want to hear that at first, right? Because he didn't, you know, he's, he's 80 years old and he didn't see himself doing that. But you see, but God waited until when his physical strength was gone, that he couldn't rely on his own wisdom and his own knowledge and his own know-how. Because remember, prior to that, 40 years prior to that, he took matters in his own hands, did, did he not? Yes. Right? He, he knew he was called. He knew there was a call on his life. He knew that he was called, he was born to be a deliverer. But he ran ahead of God. And you all know the story. The Bible says that he ended up killing an, an Egyptian. And he thought that his people, the Israelites, would understand. I mean, he was still living in the palace at this time. And he thought that they would, they, they would understand, but they didn't. I mean, they were in so much anguish, they didn't really care, right? Um, about what he wanted to do. And um, the next day he found out that it was common knowledge that he was the one who was responsible for killing a man. And he realized he was in deep trouble. So he fled for his life, he took off. He left the throne, he left Egypt, left all that, and he went into the wilderness. He spent 40 years there, so now he's 80 years old when the burning bush is burning. When God appears to him and God is revealing himself to him and giving him instructions, now I'm commissioning you to go get my people out of Egypt. Yeah. He doesn't want to. See, 40 years ago he wanted to. But not now. His energy is gone. His strength is gone. His uh, pride is gone. Everything else is gone. God waited. Glory to God. God will sometimes wait until when we get to the point when we're no longer trying to do our own thing. You know, when we become totally dependent on Him. You see, because left up to Moses, if God had backed him up when he was 40 years old, he would have said, it was, oh, my strength, my power, he would have taken all the glory for himself, wouldn't he? But you see, but now he's an old man, relatively speaking. And he's going before Pharaoh, and anything that's going to take place, he's, got, he's totally dependent on trusting God. Now, God gets all the glory, God gets all the praise. It's not about Moses, it's all about God. You, 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 see, you see this? And sometimes God will do that with our lives. You know, if, if he sees that you're headstrong and you don't want to cooperate, he'll just wait. <laughs> Hallelujah. But um, I want you to know we don't have another 40 years to wait. No. Okay, what's going on in this world is not sustainable. We don't even have another 10 years, as some preachers would have you believe, you know. You know, um, no, it's, it's, it, the, the time is very short. So we need to conduct ourselves accordingly that way. You know, that the time is short, it's a matter of days, weeks, I believe, um, months at the most, but we're in that season. So we don't have, uh, we don't have time. Moses had 40 years, right? He messed up and he had 40 years to recover. If you mess up now, you don't have 40 years to recover. Are you hearing this? Okay? This is not the time for messing up. This is not the time for turning your back on God. This is the time for drawing closer to God. All right? I do, I do want to encourage you all. Let's, let's encourage each other to draw closer to God. And I'm going to repeat some things that we heard over the weekend just to re-emphasize certain things because I believe God wants on certain, th certain things to be re-emphasized. Uh, hopefully you were paying attention to the message on Sunday morning, but you should have recognized what your takeaways were, every one of you. And I trust that if you understood what your takeaways are, you are, you are acting on it right now. This is now Tuesday. One of the major takeaways from that message was God said, I'm giving you instructions to secure your seat for when I come for the church. And what was that instruction? Take communion on a regular basis. Don't wait until when we gather together once a week to have communion, right? 
For others, don't wait until once a month. Like some churches only have communion once a month. Some it's once a year. And the once a year is Resurrection Sunday. Right? That's when they'll celebrate communion, Resurrection Sunday. Others, they'll do it a month, once, once a month. And God is saying, don't wait until then. Because you're missing out. There's a work that God can do in our lives when we take communion on a regular basis that nobody else can do, that you can't do on your own. It's a hidden work, working in, on our spirit. Jesus said in the New Testament, he said, do this as often in remembrance of me. A remembrance of what? His death. Remembrance of what? What he accomplished at Calvary. A remembrance of what? How he rose again from the dead. You know, we're to eat that bread, we eat, we're to drink that wine we, in remembrance of him. That's what he had the last night before he was crucified. He, he celebrated the Passover Seder. The communion meal is based on the Passover Seder. We all know that. There's a connection there, right? Hallelujah. Right? In the Passover Seder, they ate bitter herbs. They, they drank the, the wine, representing the blood. They drank the... Um, you, you know, they, they, they ate the, 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 the lamb's roasted lamb, representing the lamb of God. Did they not? Yeah. Right? In communion, we have the bread, the wine. These, these are covenant elements. When somebody is entering into a covenant with somebody, these are, this is covenant food. This is covenant meal. And you only eat that covenant meal with people that you are entering into a covenant with. Amen. Hallelujah. The wine represents the blood. Yes? yes. Mm -hmm. What blood? The blood of Jesus. Right? Every, every, every time, uh, um, uh, every time uh, uh, a husband and wife comes together physically, it's, it's a renewal of that covenant. If you can think of that intimacy that takes place between husband and wife on a spiritual level, so it is with us when we have communion with God when we have communion on a regular basis. It's that intimacy that's taking place. Now it might be hard to comprehend, but God is not asking us to comprehend first before we do, he just says do. Amen. And as we do, the, uh, the spiritual lessons will come, the spiritual blessings will come, the breakthroughs will come, whatever is needed will come. God will do a work in us. Amen? Amen? So, the scripture tells us in the epistle of John that when we see Jesus, we shall be like him. Do you remember that? Yes? And, uh, and it goes on to say, every, everyone that has this hope The hope of what? Seeing Jesus, right? Yes. Will uh, what? Purify themselves. Mm -hmm. Glory to God. Mm -hmm. So when we take time to uh, partake of the Lord's table, Whether you understand it or not, you are actually taking steps to purify yourself. Because God is doing a, a hidden, cleansing, cleanup work in you. And therefore, when you if you understand this and you can understand the revelation, the importance of it, that you won't get into a ritual and don't let anybody tell you, oh, it's ritual, it's just religion and all that. You, you see beyond that and says, no, I'm doing this because I'm in an int it's an intimate thing with me and God, Amen. right? With Jesus, just like a husband and wife gets together. It, 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 it is an intimate thing. Um, so it is on a spiritual level, okay? Amen. So that... Love is renewed, that covenant is renewed, that intimacy is renewed. 
And what is interesting, God has established this to happen once a year at this time of the year in this particular month. Amen. That we are not to forget what Jesus accomplished for us in the first month called Nisan, being the Lamb of God. Amen. We saw the type of it in Exodus when the Israelites took the, the lambs on the 10th day, they put it aside examined it, make sure that it had no spots, no blemishes, no disease. And on the 14th day, they killed it. The same thing happened to Jesus. On the 10th day, we know from the New Testament that before he was crucified, he came into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, which was the 10th day. He is the Lamb of God, rode on a colt, donkey, that was a sign to the Israelites that this is your Messiah, because it tells us in Zechariah what to look for. Yeah. They should have recognized it. Some may have recognized it. It seems like the religious ones did not want to recognize it. And it's interesting, between the Sunday and the Wednesday, four days later, which is the 14th, they did examine him. They checked him out. They tried to, uh, they wanted to arrest him. They asked him all kinds of questions. If you remember when he went into the temple, when he rode into Jerusalem, after that he went into the temple, and when he saw the money changes, Jesus was so indignant, he was so angry, that he made a whip and he drove them out. He said, my house is supposed to be a house of prayer, not a house of thieves. I'm paraphrasing all this. Well, you see, the authorities didn't like that. And they said, who gave you this authority to be doing what you're doing? He said, well, let me... I'll answer your question if you answer my question. And he asked them a question. And he said something to this effect with John the Baptist. Who sent John the Baptist? Where did John the Baptist come from? They said, oh, well, they murmured amongst themselves and discussed amongst themselves and said, well, if we say it's from heaven, then he says, well, why don't you recognize it come from heaven? But they came back and said, we won't say that. We, we, we don't know where John got his authority from. Well, then Jesus went and said, so neither do I tell you where I got my authority from. But they did examine him. Right? Four days. And the night before they crucified, that's when they arrested him, and that's when the intense examination took place. Are you really the Son of God? And they brought all kinds of, you know, uh, those kind of people to bring false accusations. They had problems trying to agree to fabricate the lie, because you need two witnesses to say something is the same thing. And they couldn't get in, and finally the, the, the high priest said, Tell, I adjure you in the name of God. And that's when Jesus responded, because he used the name of God, I adjure you in the name of God. Tell us, are you the son of God? Jesus said, you say so. Oh, we don't need anything more of this. You've condemned yourself. But they did examine him for the four days. Yes. Right? And he is the Lamb of God. And then 9 o'clock the next morning, he was on the cross, crucified. It didn't take them long. They made a quick decision, and, and they got on with it right away. And he was crucified between the evenings. Right? The King James says between the evenings. As you know, the Bible, the Hebrew day starts the evening before. Mm -hmm. So when he was on the cross at 9 o'clock the next morning, it's between the evening, because the, the, the day really started the, the evening before. Yes. Right? And before the, the, the day was expired, the day that Jesus was crucified, before it expired, Jesus breathed his last breath around 3 o'clock in the afternoon when they would normally be sacrificing in the evening sacrifice, the lambs. Mm -hmm. And he said, Father, into thy hands I commit myself, and he breathed his last breath. He said, forgive them for they don't know what they've done. That's right. That's right. And when he breathed the last breath, the Bible says the temple curtain rent in two, which was next to impossible because it was so thick, but supernaturally for me it was, as the Bible says, indicating the way of holy of holies was made clear for us to enter in. God. Glory to God. Praise Jesus God. accomplished all of this. The first, all this was in the first month, the month of Nisan. This is a very important month. This is a holy month, so to speak. Thank okay. It's a special month. All other biblical feasts rest on this month. If this month did not, if this did not, if the Passover did not take pl place, if the crucifixion didn't take place, all what happened in the first month, there would be no Pentecost. Mm -hmm. There'll be no Feast of Trumpets. Mm -hmm. There'll be no Feast of Tabernacles. Right. There'll be no Day of Atonement. 
the, all, other, all the other six feasts rest on what happened in the first month. Mm -hmm. In fact, all of the six feasts rest upon what happened when Jesus Christ laid down in his life. Yeah. Because yeah. in that, what do we see? We see the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Right? Mm -hmm. Jesus was put in the tomb before the Feast of Unleavened Bread started. The Feast of Unleavened Bread would have started that very evening. So they got him down off the cross, and he was in the tomb before the Feast of Unleavened Bread started. Mm -hmm. And as he said, he'd be in, he, he said, you ask him for a sign, the only sign I'm going to give you is that as Jonah's, Jonah the prophet was in the, in the belly of the fish, the whale, for three days and three nights, so shall I be in the heart of the earth. Yes. Yeah. And so he was. Yeah. So do your math. And you'll see if you count three days and three nights from Wednesday, it brings you to Saturday night or early Sunday morning, whichever way you want to look at it. All right. So it was in the week that he was in the middle of the week when he was crucified. OK. Now, don't stumble on this, because when you read in the gospel, it will tell you that after the Sabbath, that's when he um, rose from the dead. Right. That's a normal Sabbath. In other words, you would tend to think, because Feast of Unleavened Bread is a, fe is a Sabbath in the week, right? Yes. The first day. Yeah. So some people misinterpret it and think that, okay, so if, he's in, if he died Wednesday, which, which we believe he did, he's in the grave Wednesday night, all day Thursday would be uh, the first day of Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is, a, which is a holy day, a Sabbath day. You don't do any work. Right? The next day would be Friday. He didn't rise then. He rose after the normal Sabbath. Yeah. So there were two Sabbaths in the week, if you want to call it. Yeah. So you understand. I see some puzzled looks. Am I losing anybody? There were two Sabbaths in the week. Okay? Jesus is crucified at Passover. Mm -hmm. Let me back up again, right? Okay? To fulfill the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which goes for seven days, he has to be in the grave, buried, before the Feast of Unleavened Bread starts. Yeah. So before six o'clock comes, roughly, before six o'clock comes, beginning of the new day, Jesus has already been taken down from the cross and he's buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. Yeah. All right? His body is there for three days, three nights according to what he said. All right? At the end of the three days and three nights, his body did not see corruption. It didn't decay. Before it started to decay, he rose again from the dead. Unleavened bread means, you know, sin, corruption, all of the, uh, sorry, the absence of that. He fulfilled the unleavened bread because there was no sin in him. Amen. He is the bread of life. So when you take communion, he is the bread of life. Mm -hmm. That's why when you, the, I know some people out of ignorance, they will take, when they're having communion, they will eat bread that has leaven in it. But if you understand the scriptures, you don't want to do that. Mind you, if you got nothing, if you have nothing, you hear me? Mm -hmm. Then fine, go ahead. Right? Better to eat something, have the Lord's communion, than not eat it. But Jesus, his body had no sin. Leaven represents sin. All right? That's why for seven days, for the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which starts immediately after Passover, the Jewish people are not supposed to have any leaven in their home. That is yeast. Because yeast, cause, yeast causes the dough to rise. And the Bible talks of yeast as symbolic as sin. Mm -hmm. You get a little bit of yeast in a little bit of dough, and you leave it there long enough, it's going to cause the dough to swell and swell and swell and rise up. That's how you make bread. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You, need, you need yeast to make bread. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes? Mm -hmm. But the Bible likens it to like sin. Mm -hmm. You have a little bit of sin in your life. It'll be like cancer, 
Everybody can relate to cancer, right? When I say they can relate to it, they understand it that if somebody's being diagnosed with cancer, you don't want to let it go unchecked because if, it, if it's allowed to go unchecked, it'll spread over the entire body and before long, it'll kill the body, right? So this is what leaven does or sin does. But Jesus had no sin. So he fulfilled on the Feast of Unleavened Bread because when he rose again three days and three nights later, he fulfilled it. And, and by doing that, three nights and three days later, he fulfilled first fruits. He's the first to rise from the dead and not die again. Praise he's the captain of our salvation. Yes, amen. Because he's holy, you and I can be holy. Amen. Because if the first fruit is holy, the rest will be holy. Yeah. Amen? So, it's, it's, so he's first and therefore enables us to come along and be holy too. Right? Amen. Then 50 days later after that, what do we have? We have Pentecost. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? There'd be no Pentecost if, they, if Passover didn't take place. No first fruits if Passover didn't take place. No Feast of Unleavened Bread if Passover didn't take place. And then later on in the year, in the seventh month, there's, there's no um, Feast of Trumpets, which is yet to be fulfilled. There's no Yom Kippur, which is yet to be fulfilled, or the Day of Atonement. Yeah. And there's no Feast of Trumpet, uh, tr Feast of Tabernacles, which is yet to be fulfilled. Mm -hmm. All of these biblical feasts rest on what takes place in the first month. Yeah. So this month is the month of miracles. This month is a month of deliverance. Amen. It's a month of breakthroughs. Amen. And even though, although you know the biblical story, whatever breakthroughs you need, you believe God for it. Amen. If you've got any secret sins in your life, guess what? There's some people that know about it. God knows this one, right? Mm -hmm. The enemy knows about it, and you know about it. Yeah. So there's three beings there that know about those secret sins. Mm -hmm. Do something about it before it's too late. Amen. Taking communion is going to help you. So if you're harboring any, uh, I'll give you an example, lustful thoughts. Some people struggle with that. Some people struggle with different things. Their, their, their thoughts, it may not be lustful thoughts, but they're entertaining thoughts that are not good. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, just different things. Some people are worrying about this and worrying about that. The Bible clearly tells us in the New Testament, be careful you're not, encumbered, you're not encumbered about with many things. Like, you're worrying about this and worrying about that and you get distracted. Right? So, you, you want to be taking communion, following the instructions that we receive to help purge these things out of you, to help settle you. If you are having difficulty believing God for any of his promises that he's given to you in his written word or even through personal prophecy, you can settle it over communion. That's one of the benefits of it. So if you're struggling in any area of your life, just go to God by yourself. He says, God, I, I admit I have an issue here. That's the first thing God wants to hear from you, that you're admitting that you have an issue. You know what? You, you've got deliverance right there. That's right. The moment you could admit, I've got a problem, Lord. Uh -huh. Right? Yeah. You're on your way. But when you, when you pretend you got it all together and you don't, when you pretend that you're a goody two-shoes or you've arrived and things like that, or you're that spiritual and you, in reality you're really not, uh -huh. then you're in for a fall. You're not going to be going anywhere because God sees right through us. He's looking for sincerity, sex. Amen. Okay, he's looking for honesty. He's looking for people who really, want to, who really wants to make the effort. And therefore, when he comes back for his people, it's for those who have made the effort. Yes. Amen. It's not those who just, um, well, I'm going to go along with this and because my family goes to church, I'm going to go to church. And because when God comes to them, he takes them, he'll take me. Not necessarily. Mm -hmm. If you reach the, past the age of accountability, you're on your own. Especially if you understand right from wrong. Mm -hmm. I, I hope we're, everybody's understanding this. Yes. Right? 
You, you are responsible. So, taking communion is going to help bring deliverance. Because as that intimacy, you have that intimacy with Jesus, this is very presence that's going to come, that holy presence, hallelujah, it's going to help purge, in other words, if there's things in your life that are not right, unclean things, or whatever is not right from God's perspective, it's not going to be able to be free to stay there comfortably. Something is going on, will be taking place on the inside of you. I'm talking about the innermost being of your heart. And if you're taking communion on a regular basis, it, I, I, you've heard us say this before, but what it's going to do, and I'm repeating it again so that everybody understands that make sure you get the proper takeaway from the Sunday's message from Passif, when God was using Pastor Faith, is that it's going to help purge some things and bring things to the surface. Right. And some of you have your own testimonies in the past, but I, one I've shared with you in the past is that there was a time period when I started taking communion on a reg regular basis, more so than just once a month. And I, there was a season I just really got into it. And several weeks into it, I found myself very irritable. I found myself snapping here and snapping there. I found myself uh, angry, more so than normal. And uh, um, it took a little while for me to realize what was going on. I didn't recognize what was going on at first, but I was wondering, what's happening? What's happening with me? Why is this happening? What's going on here? And all this kind of stuff. And then finally I realized what was going on. God allowed what was hidden that I may not have been, what I may not have realized was there to come to the surface. In other words, it's in your face. And it may even be in the face so others can see it too. Well, you know, if you're angry, people are going to see it, right? Right? But the point is, it's going to come to the surface so you see it. You have to recognize it. Because it comes to the surface, and because God has given you and I a free will, He's not going to force anything on us. If you want to stay in a certain addiction or a certain sin or a certain vice, if you want to remain in a certain way, he will allow you to, because that's your choice. That's your soul making that decision. Yes, sir. Yes. And he will not go against it. Because one of the faculties of your soul is your will. Mm -hmm. You have a free choice. Yes. Yeah. So at that point, when you see things come to the surface, and if you recognize what it is, this is because I'm taking communion, then you could do something about it and says, God, I have a problem here. In my case, it happened to be anger at that time. So I had to take it to God and get the victory over it. You see in a sense? Yeah. Now, yours may not be anger. It might be lust. Are you hearing this? Yeah. It may not be lust. It might be an addiction. In other words, you may not even know it's there, but you have a strong desire to carry out or do something that you know you, you, you shouldn't do and you don't really want to, but you feel compelled you need to. God is letting you know that's a spirit that needs to go. Amen. Left on check, it will manifest one of these days. Is this making sense to you? Yes. I'm trying to share with you one of the reasons why you should be taking, take heed to the, the seriousness of the message on Sunday to take communion. It has a purging effect. It has a cleansing effect. Not only a purging and a cleansing effect, but it, it, it has an intimacy. It'll bring you closer to the Lord. The closer you get to the Lord, the more you're going to shed off what you need to shed off. Amen. And some things are not necessarily sinful, but they need to go because they get in the way. Where you're going, there's some things you just don't need. Mm -hmm. Some people have a way of thinking a certain way that's not correct, and God wants to correct that. Mm -hmm. All right? 
Some of us are not seeing things the way we're supposed to be seeing things. We're seeing things through distorted lenses. And those lenses, are, the filter that we see things through is, is, could, could possibly be a distorted, an evil lens, you know, um, not a godly lens. It's not faith, it's more fear. He wants to deliver us from all that. Amen. So if you find suddenly things are happening and fearful, again, if you find something is going on, stop and don't, don't, don't just, just think that this is the worst. Don't think how you normally would think. Just stop and say, Lord, is this a result because I'm taking communion on a regular basis? I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but sometimes when you go to the doctor and they give you some whatever medication they tell you to take or whatever, you, you start taking it, right? You tend to think that you're supposed to get immediate relief right away. Yeah. And sometimes some medications are like that. But have you been to the doctor, you go back and says, you know, ever since you gave me this medic, you told me to take this medication, things have gotten worse. <laughs> Has that ever happened to you? Yeah, true. Well, that's happened to me a couple of times. I go back to the doctor and the, and the doctor has a smile on, on, on the face. Like, in other words, it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. I said, what? <laughs> you know, that's a good thing? Yeah, it's doing what it, what's supposed to do. Well, I didn't know I was supposed to do that. Yes. And then, you know, after a while, it subsides and you realize, oh, that was just your body reacting. Mm -hmm. It had to go through that, but you tend to think if you didn't know, if you didn't have somebody to tell you, it's not a bad thing. It really is a bad, it's a good thing that that is going on. I don't know, if that's, if that's, if you've, if you've ever experienced something like, like that, then you'll, then you can see it from a spiritual point of view, that when you take communion and things start to come to the surface, you may tend to think that's a bad thing. It really is a good thing because now you have an opportunity to deal with it and says, God, I want to give this over to you. I don't want to keep this in my life. In fact, I didn't even know it was there. And sometimes you know it's there. But sometimes some things come up and you didn't know it was there. All right? All right? Because, you know, saints, we, 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 we've got to be realistic. I mean, um, if I use this as an extreme illustration, I think you'll get the point. Lots of times they arrest people and they commit horrible crimes. And, you know, and some of these people are the nicest neighbors. Mm -hmm. Some of these people, you wouldn't dream that they would have ever done that. Mm -hmm. Certain things, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, and sometimes it comes out in the papers or the articles or whatever. And this said, I never saw myself doing that, but it just happened suddenly. Well, guess what? There was a spirit there, probably lurking around for quite some time. And now the time came for it to manifest. And because they didn't have enough power to resist it, they went along with it, and they found themselves doing something they shouldn't have been doing. And now they're spending the rest of their life in jail. Point B, what I said, what I, what, if you understand what I'm saying, there's some things about us sometimes, saints, that we do not know is there. The closer we draw to the Lord, the more things are going to come off and shut off. It cannot, these things cannot stand in the presence of God. And you'll find that when you stand before God, and the Lord may choose to show us some things, he says, you remember that time when you were praying? He says, yeah, well, you didn't know that. This is what left from you. This is what left from you. That was left from you. Remember the time you went to church and hands got laid on you? He said, yeah, this is what left from you. I was delivering you from this, this, and this. Oh, I didn't realize that, Lord. Remember the time when you were alone and having communion or reading the Bible and just, just pr pray alone and all that? And you, you remember all this situation? He said, yeah, Lord. Well, this is what I was doing for you, but you didn't know it. Wow, thank you, Lord, for delivering me. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for setting me free. I didn't realize what was going on, because there's a lot we don't know. There's a lot that we're not aware of. Okay? That's how far we've fallen as a human race. Right? We've come short of the glory of God. So go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Give you some biblical references to what, just to reemphasize what we're talking about here. In um, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the first part of the chapter is about a, a fellow at the, at the church of Corinth that had an immoral issue, a sexual immoral issue, all right? Because it starts off, it says, it's been reported commonly that there is fornication among you. And he's saying, you know what, it's not even the Gentiles have this kind of uh, immoral, immorality, so it's pretty bad, right? Read it for yourself. But that's not where we're going, right? But where we are going, I'm going to read from um, 
from verse uh, 6. It says, Your glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. That's what I was just talking about a, a little a moment ago. Leaven is yeast. You still with me, saints? Yes. Okay. And if yeast is put into dough, or leaven is put into dough, or yeast is put into dough and is left unchecked, it's going to cause the dough to swell. It's going to cause the dough to rise. Likewise, sin left unchecked will affect the whole body, the whole environment. It's going to grow and increase. And if you still can't relate to that, then think about cancer. Cancer left unchecked will grow and grow and grow until it kills the body. All right? So the scripture is saying here that um, your glory is not good. He's talking about, you have to read the verses prior to what I was just mentioned before. You know, um, know ye not that the little leaven or a little sin, if you want to call it that way. All right? You might want to substitute the word sin. Leaveneth the whole lump. It causes the whole lump to become, to rise. A little sin will affect the entire body. And therefore, we need to come to the place that we're not comfortable with just a little sin or one sin or two sins or say, well, I'm, I'm okay, God will let me through. No, it, it has the potential to ruin the whole being. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right? So he goes on to say in verse 7, again, this is King James. If you have a more modern translation, it's probably much more clearer to you. But King James, old King James says, purge, their, purge out, therefore, the old leaven. Get rid of the old yeast. Get rid of the old sin. Mm. Why? That you may be a new lump. As ye are unleavened. In other words, you're supposed to be unleavened. Unleavened means absence of yeast, yeah. absence of sin. Sinless. 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 Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Okay? Yeah. All right? For even Christ, here it is, even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Right? Again, it's, refer it's reminding us back what happened at Passover, what all that is about, what Jesus accomplished. He, one, what Jesus accomplished, he didn't accomplish at any other season but Passover season. And what we read in the book of Exodus, when God brought the Israelites out of, out of Egypt in that Passover season, it was a deliverance, and what God used Jesus to accomplish thousands of years later at, at, at a Passover season. They're connected. And it goes on to tell you even further in verse 8, therefore let us keep the feast. What feast? Passover. Mm -hmm. In other words, take communion. Amen. Eat, the, eat the bread and drink the wine. Yeah. Grape juice. You know, have communion. Thank you, Lord. Not with the old leaven, not with the old sin. Don't allow the old sin to stay there. You know, get rid of it, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness. You know, malice and wickedness are like secret sins. If somebody's been drinking, you know they've been drinking. You can smell it on them or you can watch their behavior. That's true. Isn't that right? And you said, ah, oh, you've been into that stuff, right? But when it comes to some, some other sins, you can't really put a finger on it all, all the time. You know, there goes, uh, he's full of malice. I mean, if, you, if the, he, he or she opens the mouth, sooner or later you'll tell there's malice there. But there's some things you can't really put your finger on so easily. It's not so tangible. Secret sins. Right? Therefore, let us keep the feast not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with what? The unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Glory to God. So when you take partake of the Lord's table, glory to God. God is doing a hidden work in you that there's no other way it can be done but via this. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why we see, again, we see in the scriptures, and the unfortunate thing about it, this is not taught very well in the church on a whole, and therefore, a lot of Christians be believe that, you know, communion is an option. You know, to take communion is what? An option. If I miss it, I'm not missing anything. Not realizing you're missing out on a whole lot. Are you all beginning to understand this? Right? I remember when we, many years ago, 
when we started, when we, God started opening these, these revelations to us and we started going down the road, start communion more, start to take communion more regularly. Um, there were some folks in our midst that, oh, you, you get into, you, this is a ritual thing. They didn't, they didn't want to understand. It's not a ritual. We're not talking about a ritual. Right? So if you find you, you're taking communion every day, you, no, no, this is not a ritual. It, it, you're being intimate with Jesus. Amen. Right? Mm -hmm. if, if somebody was to ask you, those of you who are married, this as well, you're being intimate with your wife or your husband, it's a ritual? No, you wouldn't say that. Mm -hmm. And I keep coming back to that because that's the level of intimacy and beyond that, because this is beyond that physical thing. Mm -hmm. oh, you all understand? Okay, this transcends that. All right? So, therefore, we see in the scriptures, um, if you turn with me, we, we, we normally read this every Saturday, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And he gives us the guidelines for having communion. Right? You all there? First Corinthians chapter 11? Okay, so let's read some familiar verses again. It says, uh, I'm reading from verse 23. First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. For I have received the Lord that which also delivered unto you. In other words, what I received, Paul said, what I've received, it's, also, it's, already, it's been already delivered to you. Amen. Right? So this is not new to you. This is what he's saying to the church. Right? That the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. Look what Jesus is doing. The night he's betrayed, and he knew he was going to be betrayed, he's having communion. What's he doing? He's drawing closer to God. Amen. You see that? Fast track. Hours later, after this, what's, what's going on in the Garden of Gethsemane? Jesus is there. He's sweating drops of blood. Nobody's laid any hands on him. This is how much how he's, he's under a lot of pressure already. Drops of blood is coming from his forehead, right? And what does the Bible say? God sent an angel to what? Strengthen him. You see, since. He had already taken the spiritual recipe ahead of time. Praise God. Understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. Right? And so when an individual is uh, taking communion on a regular basis, you are in, that's one of the ways you are going to help strengthen your inner man. Mm -hmm. You're going to help purge your inner man. There's a lot of things going on when we are partaking on a regular basis. Yeah. In other words, since you're going to get to the point, you're not going to be comfortable with some things that you may be okay with today. It ha you're going to get to the point that says, no, this has to go. I've got to change my behavior here. I've got to stop doing this. I'm going to start doing this. Or I'm going to start doing this and stop doing that. Whatever. Some changes are going to come about. Godly changes. Amen. If you're sincere. If, if you really mean business with God. Right? Verse 24, and when he had given thanks, he break it and said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, so, well, if, if, if we pause there for a moment there, right? The bread represents the body of Jesus, Amen. right? And he said, eat it in remembrance of him. So, as you're taking communion, you, your mind is supposed to be on Him. Yes? yes? Yeah. Don't let your mind wander. In other words, you might, you might want to get yourself in a situation, get, put yourself in a situation where you're not going to be distracted. All right? It's an intimate moment. Just a moment. Yes? Yeah. All right? Do this in, re in remembrance of me. Think about what he accomplished for you at Calvary when he rose again from the dead. All right? After the same manner also, he took the cup when he had supped. 
So he even drank of it too, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. Glory to God. This is a new covenant he's bringing about. Now can you see this is a covenant meal? This do ye as oft as you drink it again in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. And by showing the Lord's death till he come, glory to God, there's a work that's being done in you. You're identifying with Christ every time you partake at the Lord's table. You are identifying with Him. Praise God. Okay? You're showing His death till He come. What do you accomplish? Mm -hmm. So, personally, you're kind of dying to some stuff. <coughs> you're becoming dead to some stuff you need to come dead to. You all begin to see this? Yes. There's some things we need to become dead to that are not good, that are harmful, that are dangerous, that can mess us up. Yes? Mm -hmm. All right? Now, you just don't approach the Lord's table just any way you want. It's a holy thing. Likewise, the Bible says the marriage bed is holy. It's not to be defiled. Therefore, as you partake of the Lord's table, it's not to be defiled. It's not to be treated unholy. This is a serious thing. The Bible says marriage is honorable, right? That's what it says? Yes. Right? Um, verse 28. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Take time to examine yourself. All right? In other words, check yourself out. Have you heard Minister Paul said the other day, judge yourself so that you don't need to be judged. And that's what the Bible says. Judge yourself. Because if you take time to judge yourself, you will, you will want to make some changes. It's better for you and I to judge ourselves. I says, you know what? I messed up over here and I messed up over there. And I messed up over here. In other words, you're reflecting and you're thinking about this. He says, you know what? I'm going to change my behavior in Jesus' name. Lord, I need your help to help me change my behavior. I don't want to be doing that anymore. I'm not comfortable doing that anymore. I used to be comfortable doing that at one time. The devil used to bother me now, but it bothers me. I'm judging myself. I'm not waiting for you to judge me. I'm judging myself. And then going forward with your help, Lord, I'm, not going, I'm going to change the way I behave or carry myself or whatever, whatever changes you need to make. Amen. Yes? For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. This is holy. Now, now, many denominations in the past have used these scriptures to say, okay, if you're not living right, you shouldn't be partaking of the Lord's table. No, 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 no. That's the complete opposite. If, if things are not going well in your life and, and you're not living right in that sense and it's not deliberate, if it's not, when I'm, I'm, there's a difference between when something's deliberate and not deliberate. There's some people who are deliberately sinning. They love what they're doing. You should not be partaking of the Lord's table. But if there's things in your life that you really don't want it there, you know it's not right. You want some changes. You sincerely want some changes. You should be partaking of the Lord's table because uh, this is what's going to help you get the victory. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. God. And that's why we just read in 1 Corinthians chapter, in the other chapter, about we, we, we're to eat the, with, with, with paraphrase of my own words, we're to partake at the Lord's table in sincerity. Be serious. Be sincere. Amen. Don't be partaking at the Lord's table and you're deliberately sinning. You will bring damnation on yourself real quickly. You'll bring a curse on yourself. And this is what he's saying here. But if you've got issues, you should be doing this. You don't have it together yet, you should be doing it. You know you're falling short in some areas, you should be doing this. 
That's why the Lord, God, the Lord said on, on Sunday, prophetically, as Pastor Faye was, was, was ministering, you secure yourself. A settling will come. God's going to do a work that you and I can't do by ourselves. Amen? I hope you all are understanding this. Okay? He that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Okay, those are the consequences. There are some believers that have become weak because they deliberately not handling communion properly. In a sense, they're living an ungodly life deliberately, coming to the Lord's table deliberately. They don't really want to repent. They don't really want to make changes. They think by doing it, they can cover it up. God is saying, I can see right through you. So some become weak physically and spiritually. Some become sickly. And many sleep. Well, that's a nice way to say they've passed away. In other words, there's some Christians or some believers have passed away before their time. In other words, they died before they should have because they mishandled this, this holy communion. You don't want to mishandle it. So I trust that you're understanding this, is that you don't have to be perfect and have your act together to partake of the Lord's table. That is what's been taught in the past. We're not teaching that because that was the opposite of what God wants. God wants us to partake knowing that this is going to help us. Amen. You all understanding this? Amen. Don't shy away from this. If you're a believer, you need to be doing this on a regular basis. All right? And, I, and I'm encouraging you, we're, we're encouraging each other, don't wait until we get together once a week anymore. This is not, God is saying, take it up. Amen. All right? Amen. If you are having no communion at all, and you are going from zero to once a week, you're on your way. <coughs> but many of us, we've been having it, we've been partaking on the Lord's table at least once a week, have we not? Mm-hmm. When we get together, God is saying, you need to take it up now. Amen? Amen. You're going to have to do this on your own. Pastor Paul is not going to come to your house. (laughs) You lead. All right? All right? In other words, you're going to have to take the responsibility to take it up. We'll lead it when we come together once a week, but between services, like, you know, between uh, um, the weekly services, you're on your own. You're going to have to do this yourself. Mm Right? Right? Yes, and it's all by faith. All right? Verse 31, For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Hallelujah. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. God is still gracious. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. So, I trust that y'all get the sense of the... the, the uh, Urgency, the, the heart of God, what he was saying to us over the weekend, we are in the first month. This is a special month, and it's a, it's a good reminder for us, and he's speaking to us specifically, as particularly on Sunday, we need to take this up and start to partake of the Lord's table more often. But... Now that we've taken time to talk a little bit about it right now, you're going to do it with a little bit more understanding. Mm-hmm. And with a little bit more of understanding that you've got this evening, God will add to that more. So I would encourage you, as you, as you step out into this, you start to do it on a daily basis, and if the Lord leads you to even do it more than once in a day, then go ahead. Um, you might want to take some notes and just see over a period of time the changes, because it's going to be subtle. It's not, it's not loud. The, you, you, this is this, this, this thing about it. It's not going to be like earthquakes and thunderbolts and, you know, and the Russian mighty wind coming and all that. It's, it, it, it's, it's very subtle. It's very quiet. And if you're not really a, paying attention, the, these changes are taking place and you may not realize it. Or things can come to the surface and you don't even realize it's come to the surface. And you think, and you kind of ignore it. 
No, it's because you're taking communion. Mm -hmm. Right? And God wants you to do something about it. Amen. Hallelujah. So, saints, the Lord is coming, and we want to ensure that it's well with us. I shared with my wife on the way to church this evening that I, I was searching my computer on my hard disk, and I came across a, f a file. I didn't really have time to really get into it to read it, but I said, you know, I didn't even realize I had it, so I started reading it. And this, there's this man back in 2010, 2012, he had the opportunity to see Jesus several times to go to heaven, even to hell. So God was revealing a lot of things to him and showing him some th certain things. So in, in, in his writings, he had a section about the rapture. And God showed him the, the rapture and he, was ex he experienced it. But what I found interesting, he didn't say a whole lot about it, but he said he was amongst of several Christians. Like, there were several of them. A number of them. He was amongst Christians. And he said, they were just talking about this and talking about that. And as for himself, he was just, he just kept his, he was meditating on the Word of God. And he said, suddenly the rapture happened. He said, we were transformed, became transparent. Our bodies changed and was lifted up. But he said, out of that group of Christians that were there, he said, only about three of us left were caught up, and the others remained. And he said, it's like we were, we were caught up, and I, I could use my own word, it's like they were, they were snatched up, vacuumed up, boom, and they met Jesus. Your heart and your mind has to be on him, 24 by 7. It's not about perfection. We all have faults. God knows that. Yeah. But it's all about, are you moving towards him? Amen. It's all about, are you making an effort? Do you sincerely want to make an effort? Are you sincerely making an effort moving towards him? And whatever he's showing you and revealing to you and speaking to you, you're making the changes the best way you can with his help. Those are folks that are full of God. As, com as opposed to those who just go to church or just in the name only. Oh. I gotta go back and read it. <laughs> it's very sobering. And so in light of what God has been speaking to us lately, I could see the seriousness of it. It's not so much because you're a born-again Christian. It's what kind of relationship do you have with your Lord? What kind of life are you living? Do you have an intimate relationship with Him? And if the answer is, no, I don't have an intimate relationship with Him, communion is going to help you get there. That's right. Are you all understanding this? It's going to help you get there. Because when the Lord comes, if He comes tonight and He sees that you're moving in the direction He wants you to, you're not perfect, you're gone. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Yes. Are you sincere or are you playing with the things of God? Are you playing church or you just... God knows all of that, whether we're sincere or not. Are you sincerely making an effort? Are you sincerely doing your part the best way you can? So, um, just thought I shared that with you because I found it very sobering when I read that. I said, well, this is a, it's, it's, a, um, it's very sobering. Mm -hmm. We do not want to be, want to be like that. Mm -hmm. When you think you're okay, and it's not okay, mm -hmm. and the rapture comes and goes and you're left behind. Mm -hmm. When you could, when one could have put in the extra effort day, weeks, months ahead of time, position themselves so that whenever it happens, wherever they are, they could be in the mall, they could be going for a walk, could be sleeping, could be watching TV, could be at work, 
You can be eating breakfast, wherever you are, when the time comes, you are just ready. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Amen? Amen. You're just ready. So, saints, let these truths that we've heard tonight sink deep into your spirit and act on the takeaway that we're supposed to be taking away, the instruction. Amen. Do not think you've got it together and that I don't need to do this because this is ritual. Mm -hmm. Follow the instruction the Lord has given us. Amen. Remember, the Israelites whose life was preserved the night of the Passover, the only ones whose lives were preserved and judgment did not affect them were the ones that applied the blood on the doorposts yes, and ate of the Passover meal. In other words, they had that covenant meal. Hallelujah. You guys got it? Yeah. Yes. Hallelujah. And don't think it's in isolation. Because if you go back to the scriptures, and I'm, I'm wrapping up now. When the time came for the angels of God to deliver Lot, his wife, and his family out of Sodom, they arrived in the Passover season. We know it was the Passover season because Lot served unleavened bread. And they came out. Unfortunately, one looked back and lost it. But God brought them out. All right, saints? So let us take heed. Heavenly Father, we want to say thank you so much for speaking to us tonight. Thank you for opening up your word to us a little bit more. Thank you for giving us deeper spiritual understanding. Thank you for the revelations that are flowing. I pray everyone who has heard this word tonight, that every one of us will be obedient to your word. And that we'll act on your word with understanding. Amen. And we'll act on your word with faith. And we'll put into practice, hallelujah, by faith, what you have instructed us to do so that it will be well with us. We give you the glory and we give you the praise, Lord. I bind and take authority over any spirit that would lie to any one of your people and tell them this is just a ritual. In the name of Jesus, Lord, I pray you pour a spirit upon your people that will hear this word and act on it, that they'll recognize it's the word directly from you. Speak to, continue to speak to our hearts, I pray. And I pray you'll help us all to draw closer to you. So it'll be well with us now. And in the future, and when the day and the hour comes for you to remove the church, it will be well with us. We will be counted in that number, worthy to escape the things that are coming up on this earth yes. and be able to stand before the Son of Man with great joy, with great peace. And hear you say, well done, my good and faithful daughter. Well done, my good and faithful son. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Lord, we look forward to that. And I pray, Lord, you help every one of us that has this hope to truly take all the steps we need to take to purify ourselves and to live a life that is pleasing to you. We give you the glory and we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.